The Evil Underbelly of Animal Welfare, Part 2. John Bolin exposes animal rights organizations on Rural Route Radio. In this segment, The Evil Underbelly of Animal Welfare, Part 2, Trent Luz of Rural Route Radio interviews John Bolin, who had a distinguished career as a U.S. Marshal, as a law enforcement officer, and an undercover investigator. Bolin has spent three years working as an investigator for a national animal rights organization and now exposes the inner workings of just how animal welfare works. Bolin explains how these organizations offer large donations of grant money to your local sheriff's department in exchange for being allowed to obtain all official information about an animal owner and for being named on any warrant so they can accompany law enforcement officers onto your property. Bolin explains that donors blindly give money to these organizations, which is then used to literally buy their way into your local law enforcement. This segment will open your eyes to exactly what animal welfare is really all about. Bolin explains how greed is the behind-the-scenes agenda that drives these organizations, which have tentacles in every state. This interview is just one more step to understanding the evil underbelly of animal welfare. The link to Trent Liu's interview of John Bolin is copied below. We encourage you to go on over to Rural Route Radio and hit the like button on their channel. Interviews like these are what is bringing to light the real truth about the evil underbelly of animal welfare. Hello everyone, I'm Trent Luce. Welcome to another edition of Rural Route to the program where we gather every day at this time. Well, John Boland, we do it Monday through Friday anyway. And what we do when we gather is continue to address the issues between a rural and urban America. There seems to be plenty of disrespect in the country today for those peace officers among us that keep law and order. We are a nation of laws. We expect people to obey those laws. We might try to change some of those laws, but we have respect for those who honestly do it with integrity. My guest today spent a, a, one lifetime, apparently, John Bolin, in the law enforcement world as a police officer, as a U.S. Marshal and as an undercover investigator with organized crime. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Trent. I truly appreciate you having me on. Looking forward to it. And we should also mention here at the top of the program, retired from law enforcement and then went undercover, so to speak, as an investigator for an animal rights organization. So we are going to get into talking about that. But first of all, why did you choose to be a law enforcement official? Uh, you know, I, I chose law enforcement um, based on the way that I was treated by a police officer when I was a young man. Um, I was 17 years old and, and got myself in a little bit of trouble. And a small town marshal next to the, close to the town where I grew up um, responded. And my cousin and I were treated with the utmost respect by this man and uh, you know, he didn't try to destroy our lives as teenagers. He, he, he steered us in the right direction, and, and really, that's what it was. That's, that's what uh, I thought, you know, I, I, I could do this, I think. I would like to do this. And, uh, it wasn't one of the big grandiose, you know, I can change the world type of things. It was just, that's just what got me started, just because of a police officer treating me fairly. As an individual who has uh, far too many encounters with police officers <laughs> to qualify that, John. Usually it involves uh, on the side of a road asking me why I'm in such a hurry. Um, right. There is a huge difference in how most of them, and then every once in a while you'll get this one rare individual that thinks he's a big man with a badge. And it doesn't, it, it, it's my uh, oppression, uh, impression that it doesn't take many of them 
to make the whole bushel of apples sour. Do you know what I'm talking about? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. It makes it makes um, the job very difficult for the rest of the police officers that are trying to do the right thing. Um, and you know, part of part of my job um, at the end of my law enforcement career, when I was investigating, I was investigating organized crime. That anything that was tied into illegal gambling, anything that any criminal enterprise that existed because mm-hmm. of illegal gambling, and we came across uh, law enforcement officers on the bad side um, and other, you know, criminal justice folks that were on the bad side of that. So they're there. They're there, and unfortunately, uh, like you said, um, they do make it very difficult and very hazardous and unsafe for police officers these days. The young officers that are out there in uniform in the marked cars are having to pay the price for those bad ones. Yeah, and again, I I think it's such a a minuscule number, but it's like all things, whether it's a farmer, a teacher, an insurance agent, a minister, or a police officer, it just takes one bad one to spoil the bushel. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you brought up something that I really hadn't given much thought to because I I wouldn't unless I'm watching some television show, which is all made up anyway. But if you're undercover inside of an organized crime unit and you deal with one of those individuals that doesn't know you are undercover, that would be an interesting scenario for you to experience, would it not? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, that that whole... You know, I, I did that for seven years, and, and that whole experience was um, very eye-opening. I, I've shared that with, with some young officers before because my, my law enforcement career, my entire career, has also included training law enforcement officers mm-hmm. um, in survival tactics and, and um, tactical knife and, and other things that, that I took a lot of pride in. But when I, I would explain to police officers that policing in, a, in uniform patrolling uh, the best the best analogy that I could give in comparison to the organized crime undercover stuff was you're driving down the road and you're all you see is what is above that that street level but when you start going undercover and investigating organized crime or any anything else that's undercover um, it's like you're prying the manhole up on the street and you're climbing down into that dirt hmm. and that thing and that's that's where you you're down there patrolling now. So you've kind of put away the looking for speeders and looking for those type of everyday occurrences, and you're down there really digging into the real dirt. Right. uh, It it, it can be very ugly. There's always a little sewage in that manhole. (laughs) You better believe it. Yeah. So this obviously is going to lead us into what I think we're going to talk about because we don't have a preconceived idea. We just have a discussion every day on this program john i continue to see people that get into trouble and there's one case in point in north dakota right now where they own animals and the reality we talk about that i talk about the disconnect between food producers and food consumers on a regular basis but i also see the disconnect between food producers animal owners and people who represent Let's just put the umbrella of the Department of Justice because I want to include judges, and I can take you to a case in point in a state north of you in Michigan where the judge granted a search warrant because it was proven that the gentleman did not put blank new blankets, not any blanket, new blankets on his horses, which meant he didn't care for those horses well enough. I've never put a blanket on a horse. So I'm putting this in the form of a question. Is my perception mm-hmm. correct that, the disconnect between true animal ownership and stewardship in the law enforcement world is becoming a growing problem in discerning what proper care is. It is. You, you are correct. You are correct. And there, you know, the, I, I still believe that the vast majority of, of your um, street level, again, the, 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 the officers that are, out there doing the job every day um, that don't that are not in a specialized field in law enforcement, they still have a common sense approach for the most part. Um, where where you get into the nonsense, I guess, or the the 
out of touch, out of out of touch with reality, um, is at the higher levels. It, it seems to me like it's it's uh, oftentimes, and I want to be careful here because I don't want to say anything that makes it sound like I disrespect my brothers in blue. I, I don't in any way, but I do believe that that there are many being misled and being, you know, for lack of a better term, I guess let's just say what it is: they're being conned um, into jumping on the bandwagon with some of these large animal rights organizations and and there's nothing really that happens right now in this day and age that gets more public um, gets more media coverage that's you know people patting police officers on the back um, administrators chiefs of police sheriffs um, than rescuing an, an, an innocent you know, an animal that's being abused or whatever. Um, these are huge news stories. They're feel-good stories. They look good in the news. They and and it makes police officers look like they're out there to do more than just you know beat on somebody or whatever the media has been portraying. So that's part of, in my opinion, that's part of the deception. That's part of the hook. And. Um, you know the reality of it is, uh, we'll take. You know, the, I'm trying to think of, of the term or the the phrase that I've heard before, and maybe you'll be able to help me. But there, there's the most dangerous type of deception is 90% truth sprinkled with 10% of a lie. Mm-hmm. Um, does that make sense? You, I, you, I, re- some kind of a, I refer to it as a selective portrayal of the truth. So there's a shred right. of truth that allows someone to pursue a particular thought process or agenda, yep. but the exactly. whole picture is not true. But, John Bolin, I can't let exactly. you finish your thought until we get back okay. to the second segment of a Roll Route. He's coming to us from Indiana, spent a lifetime as a law enforcement official and some time as an investigator within an animal rights organization. We'll be back. What did he really find? We'll find out when we get back with more Roll Route after this. And let's take a gander over at what's happening in the world of marketing cattle the superior way. What happened to the feeder calf market yesterday? That's the real question. All right. Today, selling video sale, superior livestock, coming from Oklahoma City. Brought to you on Dish Network, channel 232, direct TV 603, or superiorclicktobid.com. Here's what's offered today, 39,000 head. That includes 700 Holsteins. 11,300 yearling steers, 8,200 yearling heifers, 17,500 wean calves, 100 cows, calves on cows, and 1,200 head of bread stock. Get more details. Find out how you can be a part of marketing your cattle the superior way in 2018 at www.superiorlivestock.com. Welcome back to Rural Route. I'm Trent Luce alongside John Boland joining us from Indiana. And the answer is no. Hell no, John. Do you know the question? No. <laughs> I am not Give me the question. I am not providing you bacon for being on the air because oh. I'm not going to set a precedent. <laughs> I might actually give you some right. bacon, but it has nothing to I just because I want you to try my bacon because I got the best bacon ever. Yeah. But it's not because you of took course, the time yeah. and all of the screw-ups that I caused in getting you on the air. I'm just saying thank you for that, <laughs> all right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah but I get it. No I problem. Don't, I don't want guests thinking that I'm going to give them bacon if they come and join me on the air. I'm just let everybody know that. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd be uh, paying out a lot of bacon, and then they'd step it up on you. They'd, they'd, next thing they'd want is a ham or something. It's you'd, never enough. Yeah. Yep. That's right. That's right. It's like caving to an animal rights organization. It's never enough. Then they want more. You've got that right. That's exactly right. And to pick up from where we left off, uh, Trent, the the little bit of truth. Well, I'll give you. I'll just give you a scenario, an example. And and I, I worked for an animal rights organization for three years, a little over three years. Uh, a law enforcement officers oftentimes will contact an animal rights organization because they have come across a scene or a scenario that they're not sure about. And, you know, let's, let's use animal fighting for an example. It could be dog fighting, could be cock fighting, either one. Um, 
there, there's a, there could be a legitimate crime taking place. The law enforcement officer doesn't know how to handle the animal aspect of it. So they're going to reach out to the animal rights organizations. And once they do that and that, that contact or that, that communication has been established, then oftentimes there will be other animals that are non-related to the crime that will be scrutinized and often seized from property. Um, you know, it, it's, it, I've seen it. I've seen it several times over the past three years. I've been shocked by some of the ignorance um, uh, related to some of these crimes that, it, it, you know, it, it's like when they get their foot in the door, they, they get written into search warrants. Uh, the, the, the animal rights organizations get their name written into the search warrant. Mm -hmm. where they have the authority to go onto the property um, with law enforcement and search and seize. Okay, can, so, can I stop you there? Because there's two things very sure. problematic that I want to address and understand. Why does, let's just say it's a county sheriff, why does a county sheriff, upon learning some bit of information that there might be any type of alleged abuse, Contact the animal rights organization. Why is that their first contact? And I know that it happens, but I want to know why. Because that that does not compute to me. It should not be an organization that's right. trying to end animal ownership. Right. And it what what often happens, there, there's a couple of different scenarios here. The, the sheriff will call his local animal people. Mm -hmm. He'll call the local dog warden or the local society, and he'll say, hey, we've got you know, this deal out here, There's probably, there may be 30, 40 animals involved in this. Small counties, small towns, they can't afford to deal with that many animals. Right. Uh, they don't have the facilities to house them. They don't have the money that it takes to, to take care of them while it's going through the court process. And these animal, uh, these small animal organizations and, and a lot of law enforcement now, and this is something that I hope that we have time to touch on, because it was a big part of my role um, while I was with this animal rights organization, was training law enforcement and, and pushing pushing out uh, information to try to get law enforcement officers to reach out uh, when they needed help with animals to the larger organizations. But mm -hmm. um, going back, um, that that smaller animal organization may say, "Hey, sheriff, sorry, we're full." You know, as you see, we only have housing here for eight dogs, and we're full. We can't do it. We don't have the money. We don't have the manpower. Call one of these big organizations, and that's what they'll do. And the here's the big carrot, Grant, dangling the big carrot. All of the money. There, it. This is one of the big sell lines. We won't charge a penny. We will come into your county. We'll come into your city. We will fund this thing 100%. And what's the sheriff going to do? What's the chief going to do? What they're going to say? That's great. Absolutely. That's great. We it don't cost have to me money. nothing. Yeah. Thank you so much for your help. And, and not what only the cost, John, but just the mechanics of removing the animals and having a place to go with them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And and these organizations will they'll build they'll set up an emergency shelter in in a warehouse or a. a a piece of property somewhere that they can lease. Um, money is no object. The the donors, you know, fund these organizations to the tune of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I've heard individuals in leadership say, I, I put it, I, I do my budget every year, and they'll say this tongue-in-cheek and they'll say it laughing. I'll submit my budget, but we never, we can never stay within that budget. We always go way over budget. Well, because nobody, you know, that money's coming free. Right. Of course you're not going to manage that money like you care about it. It's coming from these donors that are watching these ad commercials on TV, you know. Um, it's, all, it's all deception. Now, you know, that being said, there are, there, you know, like you said, there's, there's always a bad apple in a group. There's wonderful people that I, that I worked with and met that do have common sense. 
that did have a problem with the thing, some of the things that were going on. But there's not there's not an avenue to voice your opinion. You you, you would get shut down immediately. Um, they don't want to hear any kind of opinion that's outside of their agenda. Uh, they don't want to hear any suggestions. There, I worked with some wonderful guys in the investigations uh, division of this organization that, that were just beside themselves, frustrated, because of the people that were in charge of the investigation division, uh, you know, getting by with everything, had, had people um, really convinced that, that, that they were doing and leading this group the right way and all of this other stuff going on behind the scenes that that um, they were more into marketing than they are in investigations. Is that what you're saying? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In investigations, you know, to me, and of course, you know, I know what a real investigation is, mm-hmm. and what what the investigation entailed for me. Um, I can't even use the word investigation. Really, we we would get um, complaints that would come down to us, one of the investigators, from different different places you know someone may call um, the main headquarters or they may call one of the other small branch offices and then that information would finally filter down to us what we would do is call the local jurisdiction the local sheriff the local the local uh, police dog dog warden whatever and we would say hey I'm so and so from this organization we received this complaint can you go check it out Sometimes, you know, they'll they'll say, yeah, we'll go check it out, or yeah, we're familiar with that place. We've got all kinds of complaints. We'll go check it. Other times, they're not so willing to do it. And that's when borderline bullying starts from the organization. Multiple phone calls back to that sheriff's department. Multiple phone calls. We're, have you went out and checked this? We need you to go check this. And here's another thing, Trent, that's very misleading. A lot of people think that these organizations have some type of law enforcement authority or some type of law Mm -hmm. enforcement jurisdiction. They have none, but they will lead people to believe that they do. If you're going to continue to ask yourself all of the questions that come to my mind, it's going to make my job really easy. (laughs) Because, that, and I'm I'm reluctant now to to bring this up, but here's what I want to do when we come back is, you know, mm-hmm. for me it's one thing when when that protocol that you just walked us through takes its course and the county sheriff conducts an investigation and if he goes to, based upon the facts, he, he comes to a conclusion. It's another thing, and when we come back, I want to know how often does the, in quotes, investigator for the animal rights organization say, well, the sheriff's not going to do this. I'm just going to go do that. And somebody enter my property without proper permission. That's what I want to talk about mm-hmm. when we come back. John Bolden, my guest from Indiana, a career in law enforcement and three years undercover. No, not undercover, just investigations for an animal mm-hmm. rights organization. We'll be back with more Roll Route after this. Let's talk about feeding sows. You can carry five-gallon buckets to sows. Some people have sows in gestation stalls. They pull a string. What we do is allow the computer to identify what sows in the feeding station and drop the allotted amount of feed that each sow needs in a 24-hour period. We do it with the MPS Agra computerized sow feeding system. Andrew Houston and his family for 25 years developed this system in the United Kingdom, and we're using it in Nebraska. Precision agriculture at its finest, it's simply getting the job done. mpsagra.co.uk Welcome back to Rural Routes. I'm Trent Luce alongside John Bolin. Hungry because I won't give him any bacon for joining me on the air today. (laughs) <laughs> I'll get some eventually. All right, so uh, before we went to break, I posed the question. Uh, the investigator for any said animal rights organization has a concern. They contact the local authorities. Local authorities do or don't do something. How many times do investigators with the organization who you've already told us have zero jurisdiction or authority to do anything go on my property? 
Well, to, to answer that question, um, I, I was not aware of any situation where anyone from the division I worked in uh, did that, went on to any property. I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I didn't have any personal knowledge of it. However, they do still push the limits of um, their jurisdiction in other ways. And, you know, to me, I, I mean, I understand exactly where you're coming from. I know that there are or animal rights organizations that, that are notorious for this. But to me, I feel like that it is even more atrocious to work their way all the way in to a search warrant signed by a judge and a prosecutor. Then they can just stroll right onto the property with the law enforcement officers. Yeah, why are they allowed on there with the law enforcement? And law enforcement invites them? Yeah, law enforcement invites them. There's a process that, that happens. Once law enforcement has asked for assistance, then they're, they're expected to share their entire case file. Once it, it, It's just, for example, you're, you're the sheriff, you call me, you want help. I say, yes, I'll help. Yes, I will fully fund it. Um, we're here for you. What can we do? Then you're on the hook. Then I say, hey, Trent, um, I need more information. Can you tell me who, who, these, who your suspects are? Can you tell me um, where the property is? Because we need to plan um, for when we go in and get the animals. We need to plan for this. Can you share this? Can you share that? Oh, and by the way, we have a legal department that needs to see your probable cause affidavit. Mm -hmm. Can you send me that? And all of that information comes to the animal rights organization, and they, they all are looking at it. They're looking at all of the information. They're looking at this person's, you know, is it possible that someone could be rogue after they get this information and go drive by the property or go contact this individual in some way? Um, yeah. I mean, if I have all your personal information, Mm -hmm. And and I'm not a police officer. Yeah, I don't. You know, here, here's the thing. Here's the other thing. If if law enforcement wasn't um, inviting these organizations in, they wouldn't have anything to do. I don't know what they would do if they weren't piggybacking off of, off of law enforcement. I mean, I'm sure they would find something to do, but. Um, these, these groups within these larger groups, there's groups, you know, there's divisions in um, these national organizations and, and the divisions that go out and do the field rescue stuff are the ones that wield the power. You know, this is something that the CEOs of these organizations would never admit. When they hear me saying it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to upset them because it's going to hurt their ego and their pride. But they are nothing without that field rescue team. That The man that heads up that field rescue team and the, the individual that heads up the investigations division have all the power in that organization they can get by with anything they want to get by with because that's where the donor money comes from. Everybody sees these rescues on the, on the commercials and they see it in the news and they see that they're partnering with law enforcement all the way up to the federal level partnering with these organizations and that's where the donor money comes from therefore they have unbridled power i'm not sure if you're familiar with this situation but i'm familiar with two two times that um attorney generals held these organizations accountable the last time that i'm aware of was when Scott Pruitt was the Attorney General of the state of Oklahoma, and I had him on this very program talking about the action he was taking because when there was a tornado in Oklahoma, one of these said organizations shows up, and I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, John, but they always have their logo and their letters very loudly presented on the clothing they wear for the very reason you're oh, giving us. Of course. PR. That's part of the rule. It's, you, if you don't have that on, on the on on a property, um, you're going to get in trouble. You're going they're going to want to know why you don't have that big billboard yeah. on. That is a that is a 100% uh, 
rule. And that is a billboard. Yeah. That's what it is. It's a billboard. Yeah. But mm-hmm. Scott Pruitt, as Attorney mm-hmm. General, said, hey, HSUS, you came in here, you used a situation to pill for money from communities and took it out of our out of our state and filed a lawsuit against HSUS for doing that. And then Hurricane right. Katrina, the Attorney General for the state of Louisiana, did the same thing because HSUS netted $34 million on Hurricane Katrina. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, guess what? These organizations that, um, and I, what I tell you is, you know, information that they can be backed up with a little digging. Um, they will also pay to come in. Really? They will pay you. They, they'll make an investment to come into your city after after a hurricane, after a disaster, after a flood, mm-hmm. to come in and, in quotations, assist your organization. Then you have this big glowing partnership on the news. Look, this this animal, this national organization partnering with, um, you know, wherever. Name name the hurricane um, prone city. Take your pick. This organization partnering with with this city, this state. Look at all the work they're doing together. They they butt heads. I mean, they don't want they don't want the big organizations in there. But they they literally these these last hurricanes literally paid bribed their way in basically, for lack of a better term. I mean, here, take this money and let us come and help so we can wear our shirts and drive our equipment into your city and your state and it looks like we're and, and you know, because they know their investment is gonna reap right. is gonna reap big dividends. They're gonna get more donor money because they're doing this hurricane work. Nobody sees the behind the scenes, you know, con that, that goes on. So when you started with uh, this unnamed animal rights organization, what did you think you were getting in for? I thought that I was going to be doing investigating. Mm -hmm. My title was investigator. And, uh, you know, from what I thought investigating was, it was a far cry from it. Um, you know, I, I had an undercover background, so they consulted with me a lot on undercover situations, and, and at one point in time, I had had tossed around the idea of creating some undercover policies and procedures. And um, I sat across from a table, across from a bunch of legal folks, a bunch of attorneys, and my boss and other folks in the room when this was happening, and I said, "I have a question." If I go on to someone's property in an undercover capacity and it's in a county or a state that will charge me with trespass or charge me with another crime, are you going to come and post my bail? Are you going to pay all of my legal fees? Are you going to pay all the money that I'm going to lose because I'm sitting in jail and I'm fighting for, my, you know, for what I've done under, under your umbrella? You think they gave me an answer, Trent? Uh, I'm Bunch assuming... of attorneys. You think they gave me an answer? No. <laughs> I'm assuming no. No. Good luck. No, they didn't give me an answer. Good luck, John. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Don't get oh, caught. Oh, it's for the cause. But yeah, it's for the cause. You know, you should just be willing to... You know, they didn't say that, of course, but I'm saying, you yeah. know, they, they wouldn't give me a straight answer. And it wasn't very long after that that this, this whole idea of undercover operations kind of just phased and just kind of went away because... You know, I, I feel like I'm not patting myself on the back, but I stood up for the rest of the guys in the room that were going to be asked to go into these situations. Um, so, but you have, you've really done a, an excellent job at enlightening me today because that would be my number one. Well, it was. I already voiced that. You could tell that, that the invasion of my property was my number one concern. But you really shed light on the fact that I should be equally concerned if not more, about how access to my property can be granted by somebody who ultimately wants to put me out of business, no matter what the truth is, through the guise of legal precedent, through the guise of, of coming with the local law enforcement. That's more dangerous. Right. Right. I, I have had to step up and, 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 and almost get myself in a bind with, with supervisors and say, that animal should not be seized 
I'm telling you, that animal is not related to this. Mm -hmm. And I've seen police officers do the same thing. Police officers right here in the state of Indiana say, no, we're not taking that animal. I'm not going to tell you again, go over there. Do what we ask you to do. We're not taking that animal. I've, I've heard it, I've seen it, and I've said it myself to, a, to a, an individual that had the authority to fire me. I said, that, that, that animal is not related to this. And those animals ended up staying because, fortunately, we had a, a government, a state-level board of, of animal health individual that also stepped up and said, he's right, and no, they're not related to this, and they're not going. But and, that, that's the kind of power that these individuals have. If somebody doesn't speak up, mm -hmm. did you, you know, work, call them out on it. I got 30 and, seconds here, John. Did you work outside yeah, of the yeah. state of Indiana? I worked all over the country. Yep, and I trained I train law enforcement officers for these folks all over the country. It's rural route. John Bolden, my guest, we have one segment left. We're talking about the inner workings of marketing to pilfer the public for their money, thinking they're helping animals when, in fact, they're only helping the retirement programs of those executives involved. We'll be back with the final segment after this. The third annual Range Rights and Resource Symposium is Modesto, California. This year, we will be gathering on April 20th and 21st. Now, that's a full month earlier than what we had been gathering. This is the third annual. The first one was in Layton, Utah. Last year, we were in Omaha, Nebraska. This year, the group has decided to go to John Dorday and the Dorday family's backyard. They have been pressured and defined and beat up by the federal government and so we are going to gather and talk about how we can persevere beyond the encroachment and the overregulation that we live in in today's world it's all about protecting those constitutional rights god-given rights protected to us by the constitution rangerights.com april 2021 modesto california Welcome back to World Wrapped. I'm Trent Luce. Uh, I just, you know, every segment I got to start with some fluff. I don't know why, John. John Bolin, my guest from Indiana, just the way I'm wired. It's worked for 17 years. Why change it now? But how you answer this question is going to determine how not only I view you, but the, most of the listening audience. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah. I can remain silent, though. You know yeah, you right. can. You have the right to remain <laughs> silent. You can and will be. Everything right. you say can and will be held against you of the court of public opinion. Right. Are you uh, uh, a Hoosier guy or a Boilermaker guy? Oh, man. I have to say Hoosier because my dad was. My dad used to sit, and Bobby Knight was his hero. Bobby Knight was – my dad worshipped him. So – Oh yeah, and and where I live is a, is a lot closer to IU campus than than Purdue. So yeah, Hoosier, I can't help it. So apparently, your father did not sit on the front row and have to duck the chairs all the time. <laughs> no, no, he wouldn't spend money to go. He would just walked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm always partial to the land grant institution, so. I, I know, I know, and Purdue. I know that yeah. and Purdue does some wonderful things, and I have some great friends that came they, out of Purdue. They do some stupid things too, but we'll save that for another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. I hope I passed. I hope I passed. Yeah, no, out. you flunked that part. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, hopefully but, people have a little mercy you know, on me because I'm loyal to my dad. You know, it's my roots. That's yeah, you know, that. we have to respect that. You you climbed your way out, so yeah, you're at a B plus yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you were there three years. How, how soon on after employment did you realize that this animal rights organization was not who they say they are, and they're not hiring me to do what I'm what I thought I was doing? Very soon, probably three to six months in. Um, and you know, part of it I was willing to accept. I thought, well, okay, you know, they. They're calling an investigator for whatever reason they're calling it that, but it, that's not what it is. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not allowed or expected to investigate anything. They just want me to. They wanted to use my law enforcement experience as a, as a way to for their credibility. Be able to communicate. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. their credibility, for for me to be able to communicate with other police officers. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, and I see. I don't know when this started. It, it wasn't that way when I first started going to animal rights conventions and different things 20 years ago. But in the last five years, I see this new wave. In fact, you're the second. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to be a whistleblower? Is there a better term? <laughs> um, I don't know. Whistleblower sounds kind of, I don't know. I mean, I just want law enforcement. I want law enforcement to understand what's really going on. Um, these, they, they, I just think that this is going to jump. It's going to jump up and bite them um, eventually. Yeah. By allowing these organizations to piggyback on onto their legal search warrants, and I, I think that that there can there can be ways for these police officers to do their job without having these huge organizations come in and take all the glory for it mm -hmm. and all the money. And, and, and what I want to finish that thought because it ties into what you just said. Uh, I had Eric Parker, who's now down in Louisville, on this very program two years ago, and he came out of the Army and became an undercover investigator for another animal rights organization. It seems to me in the last five years these particular groups have really uh, gravitated towards veterans and retired law enforcement officials to come into their ranks. I think that's an intentional ploy. It is, Absolutely. They, they know that they can get all kinds of credibility that way. So if you were granted the stage, which I'd like to, you know, braggadociously say, you can do it right here, John Bowen. But if you were granted the stage <laughs> to have every, uh, I'm going to talk about county, because county law enforcement officials, the county sheriff is where the buck stops in each county. What right. do you say to the county sheriff's, law enforcement officials around this country that involves everything we're talking about here today that, that sheds some light on what they need to know? I would like to, uh, what I would say is, is take your time, really, really look at what is going on. Um, once you reach out to one of these organizations, just be very cautious and, and, you don't have to share your entire case file with these folks. They're, they're going to push and push and push for all of the personal information. And they're going to push and push and push to be able to come onto the property with you and be part of everything that you're doing. They want to walk around behind you and search. And they want to be, they want to play the police officer on the scene with you. It's not necessary. You can still get the help that you need to deal with these animals in, in, in other ways than to have some organization, some huge national organization with a big agenda coming in and, and stepping all over the thing. Um, don't don't jump right on the bandwagon. Don't be conned by the, the grant money. Yes, every sheriff needs, more, needs money. They need grant money, especially, especially money that can be set aside for those types of things. These, these organizations will give you money. They'll give you lots of money. But then you'll, you, you're going to report back to them that you're using it for animal uh, cruelty investigations. And that's, they're going to get their hooks in you that way. Uh, my, my advice is send your police officers to, um, you know, send them to some training with an organization that doesn't have that type of agenda. They can get training on how to investigate animal cruelty with, without falling into that trap, if that's really what the sheriff wants. But, John, I hear them shouting back at you. They make it work for us. They take care of the animals. We don't have to deal with it. We don't have the money to handle it. They make it work. So they need they need an alternative, don't they? They do need an alternative, and there I... I don't know what the answer is at this point because it's going to take it's going to take an organization with a lot of money and with folks that know how to handle animals um, and know how to house and care for animals. It's going to take an organization like that um, to step up to handle the huge mm -hmm. cases. I have to throw this and, in because it's a burr under my saddle, and um, it, I I was a part of this testimony in North Dakota that allowed this language to be in a new bill sponsored by HSUS. 
uh, not stopped by enough ag groups in the state, but the language in this bill stated that if you are accused of an animal neglect or animal rights felony, I, I, not animal rights, animal care felony, animal abuse, mm-hmm. those animals may be confiscated from you and, re- and dispersed before you are convicted. And this has happened. I, I know many cases where people's animals have been taken. Everything that you've talked about is spot on true. The county can't afford them. Some animal rights group comes in, says, we'll take care of this. It goes to a rec- rescue. They piecemeal them out. Dan Christensen, Hurley, South Dakota, found not guilty. No animal abuse whatsoever. Meanwhile, three years later, his 72 dogs are scattered all around the country and gone. Mm-hmm. That's a serious, well, serious problem. It is. It is. And I will tell you that I know firsthand that that happens. I know it happens. And, oh, wow, so much more we could talk about, Trent. Um, the good news they, is I do they, this they, every day. They send them. Yep, yep, that is good. Um, they will send them out to other smaller rescue groups. Mm-hmm. They will. They will farm out the animals to be housed here, there, and yonder, and um, not every one of those places will take care of those animals the way that, uh, you know, I, I just, that's too much of a big topic to get into, but that's a whole other topic, the the way that that these animals end up all over the country in different places, different homes. Before and, people are convicted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're all subject to that, and... and Everybody sitting there saying, "Wow, well, I don't abuse any animal. That can't happen to me. All it takes is one person to levy an allegation against you and a couple people in the middle, the law enforcement, like John's talking about here, that don't understand, and you are they're gone. Right. Yep. Uh, two minutes. John, what do we need to know that maybe I've not brought up today? Well, you know, there, there's there's a there's an extreme there's an extreme right and an extreme left in everything, and it's finding that good middle ground that makes sense. And I think that that the problem with the animal rights organizations and the way that they're getting law enforcement to do their bidding. I think that it's time for law enforcement to open up their eyes. It's time for judges and prosecutors to open up their eyes. It's time for them to start pulling it back into the center where it makes sense, where there's a common sense approach. Um, I will also throw this out there that the numbers are hugely inflated. The the so-called animals rescued numbers are hugely inflated. A, A large amount of those numbers includes if I, if I would get a complaint, and I'll try to hurry because I know the clock's ticking down now. If I would get a call, a complaint that I needed to follow up on as an investigator, I need to call law enforcement. If I call law enforcement and say, hey, I got a call from a guy that drove by this farm and saw these cattle all standing out here and he thought that they looked sick or whatever, um, can you go check on them? Yeah, we'll drive by. I know that farmer personally. I'll drive by and take a look and I'll let you know. Drive by what? Yeah, he's, there's 50 cows out there. They're, they're fine. They're dairy cows. Um, the calf that he saw on the ground is fine. It stood up when I drove by. They're fine. That 50, that number, mm-hmm. goes into that total count. Wow. I, I, in turn, put that in the system. The, the person that is over the investigations division will add that to the total number of animals rescued for that year. Just because you did a drive-by animals? inspection? Yeah, just because the investigator called the sheriff who did the drive-by. Right. I could be calling from Indiana, and he could be in southern Alabama. But we're going to add that number because it looks good to the donors. John, we're going to have to do this again. Most importantly, I appreciate you reaching out to me and um, coming forward with the facts. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it, Trent. Thank you. John Bullen joining us from Indiana. I'm Trent Luce. We have successfully journeyed down the road. The best way, by the way, folks, is to develop a relationship with your local sheriff now, not later. 
If you like what we're doing, hit the like button below. And don't forget to subscribe to stay informed. Till next time, thanks for watching. The Animal News Network creates videos for commentary, criticism, teaching, and news reporting, and as such, makes use of copyrighted material under the Fair Use Act of 1976 and makes no claim to any copyrighted material used. Fair Use Copyright Disclaimer Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Fair Use Definition Fair Use is a doctrine in United States copyright law that allows limited use of copyrighted material without requiring permission from the rights holders, such as commentary, criticism, news reporting, research, teaching, or scholarship. It provides for the legal, non-licensed citation or incorporation of copyrighted material in another author's work under a four-factor balancing test.